We're going to look at the book of Jude. When we come to summer camp, we know that we receive something that we never received in other past weeks or days or the times that we go through in work or in school or in our own homes. That's the reason why we set aside time. We would drive a long ways. We would sacrifice some things in our schedule, in our studies, in our own conveniences, and with our work especially, to make time for this. Because this is that time where you receive something from the Lord that you've been waiting for a long time. It's a time where you can sing more easily and the song seems more uplifting. It's not that other church services were never like that. But you know in summer camp, it's different. And when you come to fellowship, you do know that you can fellowship like you always do in other churches. And I'm sick and tired of hearing it, but it is true. You got the greatest church in the world, <laughs> all of you. And because of that, the fellowship is wonderful and stirring, and you know it. But when you come to here, it's different. And that's why you made time. That's why you came to this. You weren't just content with, I'll have this at Sunday church. You say, no, this is a special day. Special day. I want to be here. Because you know that you've seen the Holy Spirit move. It was a time that you changed dramatically in your life as well. Because of that, that's why you all come here. And then why is it that when we get out there, that we don't have that same stirring of the Spirit? And then... There were people here who committed their lives for Jesus Christ on something. And some of them thought that I'm never turning back and I've decided to follow Jesus. But then you give it a couple months and then they fall back to the same old ways. And that completely discourages you. And you go, what's the matter with me? What's the matter with me? And what's even worse is that the desire that you had for summer camp, if you're going to be totally honest, and you don't tell it to us, but only to yourself, if we give it six months, and then the next summer camp is announced, instead of that desire that I want to go, it's, I'm not sure if I can go. Because... I'm too busy because I got health issues, because I got bills to pay, because of real life scenarios that we all have to face that I can't blame you for. And why is it that these things must happen? And why is it that as that one verse goes, I am bent on backsliding? Why can't I stay stuck and glued and stick to that fervent desire and that fire that I experienced at summer camp where the Lord moved and dealt with my heart. Shouldn't that be a daily thing in my life and shouldn't I be able to commit myself? Why can't I commit myself? Why can't I keep pressing onward? Why is it that Real things happen in life, and I'm scared that after summer camp, it's going to happen again to me, just like every other year. And I hate that. And I feel like Paul, that, oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? For to be carnally minded is death. For what I would, I would not, and that I do, I do, I do not. There are things that I want to do for the Lord, and I can't do it. 
And then there are things that I don't want to do for the Lord and strange, I do. And in summer camp, it's very strange that in spite of how the flesh would try to interfere or to get you to lose the fire, you somehow keep getting it. And there are those days where you thought that you lost the Lord, those days that you thought you won't come back to church, and then God just seems to pick you back up. He just keeps stirring your heart again. And just as much you are bent on backsliding, you are bent on restoration. You are bent on serving God again. You are bent on revival. How can I, how can I stay stuck in this revival and not keep going back and forth like a ping pong table or a pinball machine What is it that's missing in my life that I keep repeating the same old? We will discover that answer today. And it's the basic of all basics that you and I would know, but we really didn't know. And perhaps you don't really know now. But again, it is something that you do know. But let's answer that deep question (laughs) later on Jude 1 and then let's look at verse 18 verse 18 how that they told you there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lusts these be they who separate themselves sensual having not the spirit but ye beloved building up yourselves on your most holy faith praying in the Holy Ghost Keep yourselves in the love of God and looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And of some have compassion making a difference, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garments spotted by the flesh. Let's pray. Now, Father, fill within me the power of your Holy Spirit and the cleansing of your blood. It doesn't matter if I preached a thousand times before or if I'm the first one here, where it can be the easiest point, Lord, it is no excuse and it is no good basis or especially good authority for me to preach in my own flesh or the way that I want or to get away with things. I take this seriously. This is your sermon. This is your word. And I beg thee, Lord, and I don't care if you've been helping me a thousand times, I need thee every hour And I need you in this message one more time, Father. And I'll keep praying it always. One more time, Father. Fill me, use me, preach through me. May they see Jesus Christ and not Gene Kim. May they see their own deplorable condition that is in need of something from you. Make them desperate for thee. Make them thirst and hunger for thee. For renewal, restoration, repentance, rededication. Oh, God, minister to these hungry spirits and souls that have been dying throughout this deserted world where their books, their brooks have run dry. Oh, God. Oh, God. Feed us in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. My first point, which we will be covering in, is separation of life. The separation of life. The title of my message is Plugged In. Plugged in. I think I had a sermon a a long time ago that had a similar title, but I would like to take a different spin on that. When you have your own laptop, MacBook, or device that you're going to use, it's probably very important to you because that's where all your work projects are at. And that's your life's work if you're going to get paid for that in your workplace. So you got to take very good care of that. And especially if you're a minister and you're used to putting notes in a computer or if it is a MacBook or some sort of laptop, the worst thing that can ever happen, God forbid, is that you lose all your notes. You lose all your notes. Now, For me, I wouldn't have much of a problem compared to Dr. Walker because he has a thousand points 
and me, I only have three. So I don't think that if I were to lose notes, you know, I'll have more of the peace and faith in the Lord than he does. <laughs> but then for those of you who go to college and school, the worst thing that can ever happen to you is when you don't have your battery line with you. And then you know that, oh boy, I got to cram in. I got to do my homework because I kept putting it off. And here's a last minute thing. And then as soon as you open up your laptop and you're about to pound away at your homework and you know you're going to need a couple hours, the, the best thing that can ever happen in your life is that the battery says 10%. When you look at that, then you're panicking, then you're sweating, and you really need that. Some of you who are really fleshly, you need that, you need your laptop, you need your cell phone because you need to go on your Facebook and your YouTube and you have some game over there. And perhaps you're on a flight and it's a long flight because you video gamers and you people who go to online, two hour flight is such a long time for you and you're just so bored. You need that electronic device because it's that important to you. As much as a preacher would lose his outline, it's that important to you that I need to watch something. I need to post something. I'm so addicted to it. I got to post something. I got to play a game. So whatever person that you are, we can all agree, all right? If you have used electronic devices, it's a big deal. <laughs> whether you're worldly or semi-spiritual because you put your <laughs> notes on a laptop and you're not right with God to write it with a pencil and a notebook paper, bless God. You all need to repent and get right with God. <laughs> but whether you're spiritual or you're fleshly, if you use electronic devices, we can all agree that it is that important to me that I need that battery life. And no matter how much you try to dim down the screen. You ever done that when you get like a 20% battery and you're lost in the middle of the woods? It never, hap it never happened to me before, ask my wife. Never happened, never happened to us. But when you get a 20% battery life and you're lost in the Bohemian Grove and you didn't know you're there at midnight, <laughs> Yes. So, and then when your wife keeps saying, I keep seeing Bohemian Street, Bohemian Road, and Human Sacrifice Street over there, and then I think I see lights in those woods. And then your wife is telling you, what if this is Bohemian Grove? I was like, honey, it's not Bohemian Grove. Calm down. I saw a lot of similar roads down there that says Bohemian or San Jose or even Pensacola. That doesn't mean we're in there. And then we just kept driving for an hour and then I dimmed the screen in that cell phone because every battery life is precious yeah. because my wife is freaking out on me. <laughs> and I need to protect it. I need to save every energy. And I was working so hard to preserve that battery life. And I was like, man, if, if that thing dies, my wife is going to freak out and I don't know how I'm going to comfort her. And then I was like, honey, and then I tried other tactics. See, I'm turning off the cell phone right now. All right, so at least when we turn it back on, it'll be at 7% battery life and it'll last for about three good minutes. So I assured her, I memorized all the directions, honey, so we'll be fine. And then we kept driving through the woods and I was like, Man, I, I think I saw this on YouTube before. <laughs> I, I think I saw pictures of Bohemian Grove. This looks very familiar. And I kept saying, honey, it's not Bohemian Grove. And when we landed at the hotel and then we had 1% battery life over there, and then I was turning on and off the cell phone, on and off, and then I made sure it was on energy saver screen, and I made sure that it would lock within 30 seconds, that waiting screen. So I was just protecting that battery life. I was even switching devices with my wife, you know, <laughs> trying to protect the battery life. As Soon as we got into the hotel, she went to take a shower and I charged my phone and I opened it. I was like, Bohemian Grove. And then when I looked at it, I said, oh my goodness, <laughs> what? Yeah. And then my wife's like, what is it? I was like, 
we were at Bohemian Grove. <laughs> at midnight. Wow. At midnight. <laughs> there were so many owls there, too. <laughs> There were nice looking cars and I kept saying to her, see, these are nice people, honey, over here. So if we ever broke down, they would help us out, you know. <laughs> so I tried to keep comforting her. I tried to do whatever I can. And boy, that battery of life, I'll tell you one thing, it was important for me that day. Yeah. It was very important, but it was going to run out. It was going to die anyway. And I knew it because it was not plugged in. It was separated from its battery life. And, you know, I was very desperate because my wife's life was on the line. So I was that desperate. And I was like, you better live. You better live. But it doesn't matter how much will, mental willpower I put into that. That battery life is still going to run out no matter how much I beg for that battery. Live, live, live. Sometimes, even if I were to pray, sometimes prayer is not just going to add a 1% battery in there. Because it's not plugged in. It was separated from its battery life. Once it's out of the plug, it will lose power. It will lose life. And then that battery will go downward. And no matter how hard you try, to keep yourself clean, no matter how many times you might try to pray about it, and you can work out tactics and ways to make sure that you don't mess up in sin, that, that, you, that you keep going to church, you keep your life pure, that you keep stirring up your spirit. But if it's not plugged in, you lose power no matter what, no matter how desperate you are, no matter how much willpower you put into it, you've tried it before, your willpower ain't enough to get over that flesh. Because it's not plugged in. And these people, the reason why they followed after their lust of the flesh, they backslid. They went downward like a battery, backsliding and losing its power is because in verse 18, how that they told you, there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lusts. Now see that? It says should. Is that what it said? Should, should. It's not because God is a Calvinist making them do that, because it's inevitable that every single one of you will mess up, will backslide, will sin, will let God down, will lose the fire today, if, in verse 19, these be they who separate themselves. Yeah. See, God didn't separate you from him. It's not because summer camp is over and you're separated. You can't blame the event. You separated yourself. Sensual, having not. There's your battery life. The spirit. Now, this passage we know has much tribulation doctrinal reference where there are people who are going to have to separate themselves from the wickedness of the world, avoid the mark of the beast system, and they have to keep their salvation, keep the Holy Spirit within them. Their salvation is very dependent on that. And if they were to follow after their own ungodly lusts, just like the rest, of the beast system and the antichrist world, that new world order, then what would happen is that they would have a demonic spirit, their flesh will be controlled, and they lose the Holy Ghost. They have not the spirit. But we Christians can take a spiritual or a practical application here. It may not doctrinally apply to you, but you can sure see a lot of yourself here where in your life you don't feel like that the Holy Spirit is in you. That you don't feel like that he's there to revive you. That he's there to sustain you. That he's there to keep you going. And the reason why is you separated not your salvation, but you separated your fellowship 
from him. And when you separate your fellowship from the spirit, then you're only plugged into one thing, and that is your rotten flesh. And no matter how much willpower you put into that flesh, and no matter how much prayer you do within that flesh, and no matter how many good ideas you pull up where, well, I will come back to church. Well, I just need to overcome this thing in my workplace and then get back to God. I have this family problem that I have to go through, so let me solve that first, and then I can get back to God. No matter how good your plans are in your human flesh, it is still by the might of human flesh, not by the power of the Holy Spirit. You can dim your screen and you can switch devices and save your battery power, but it's all vain effort on your part and that battery should die without plugged in. Without getting plugged in. And that's why it seems like when you come to summer camp that even though you're not putting really much an effort to it, and you can come in here depressed in spirit, but once singing starts, it's like you just can't help it, but you just get happy. And it doesn't matter if the preacher, when he came up here and you came with, in with skepticism and uncertainty, all of a sudden the Holy Spirit was moving in your heart and you got under conviction. And it doesn't matter if the first few days of summer camp you ignore the altar call. Why is it at the middle you just feel yourself drawn to come down all of a sudden? You know what that is? There's no effort involved here. Because once the device is plugged in, it doesn't matter if the cell phone is used up even more or if you have more applications running on that thing or if you were to go back and forth switching devices or turn off the power or turn on the power. If that device is plugged in, then no matter what, the Holy Spirit will convict you and move your heart and then empower you just like that battery. And there's no stopping it. There's no stopping that battery from getting filled up once it's plugged in. And when it's plugged in, power's coming in. And then your depression can push it away. And then your sin problem can push it away. And then you're, you have these indifferent things inside your mind and heart. You have a defeatist attitude, I'll never get right with God. But when that battery power gets plugged in, for some weird reason, you feel like hope is getting drawn into your heart again. And then the Holy Spirit is moving in your heart. And then God is showing you something. And you can't help it but get right with God again and sing with your heart. Give your life to Jesus Christ and do something for him after this camp. Because it's been plugged in. Sorry to some of you. You all got plugged in today. Y'all got plugged in today and battery life must come into you. The Holy Spirit must move within your hearts and it'll keep stirring within you. You have no choice. The rest of your miserable week, the Holy Spirit will empower your life, move upon your heart, stir a fire, and that battery life will keep getting better and better and better and better and better. Because you got plugged in. And then all of a sudden, after summer camp, no matter how much willpower you put into it, and no matter how much you try to save the power, you can turn on and off the screen. I don't get it. Why do I keep messing up again? Why do I get zapped? Verse 20, the second point is the spirit of life, the spirit of life. Verse 20, but ye beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Praying in the Holy Ghost. Plugged in, plugged in. That's why they can get away from the lust of the flesh. That's why they can stay away from sin. That's why they can keep onward for Jesus Christ. But reality is, 
that when you get plugged into summer camp and when you go out in the real life doing real life things and your brook runs dry you undergo trial and there are times that God doesn't seem real to you or meet you at that time and then the same old same old you run dry and just sin 24 7 around you with that world and you can't help it but be influenced by that because you've been separated from your power you've been separated from getting plugged in and you have every best intention in the world and your heart's in it and you got the willpower for it but you can't help it you get zapped even the greatest preacher or the greatest spiritual person can't help but feel zapped why is it that when I come here it's easier when I go out there it's harder because been separated from the plugged in being conjoined to being plugged in it makes a big difference well the thing is for some of us or maybe even most of us how we ended up in this summer camp to begin with was not really that we had every willpower or intention to come to summer camp if we're going to be totally honest it's because somebody else told you how great the summer camp was it's because someone kept following up on you it's because someone kept praying for you it's because the lord opened up doors and opportunities where you can get space from your work time and space from your school. Yes. It's because of the pastors and the churches who worked hard together to build, uh, to build you this system and to get all the games arranged, to get, make sure that you have your cabin, your living spaces taken care of. And it took months of planning and hard work from others who had compassion and they made the difference in your life Amen. where you got plugged in Amen. not really yourself and that's what happened here at verse 22 and of some have compassion making a difference see those people had compassion and that's the reason why they were able to get those people to be plugged in the Holy Ghost because they had compassion. Let's be honest with a lot of you young people. Your parents and your pastor had compassion to make the difference where you came to summer camp and it was at that summer camp God changed your life. Young people, think back. And this includes all of us. Think back. Think back at that time where you weren't plugged in. You were separated. And you weren't sure about the zeal or the fire to serve God. And uh, the world around you was tempting. And you had your own plans of what you're going to do in life. Some of you didn't even want to come to summer camp to begin with. It's something that you have to do. That's what you feel like. Or to just get over with, or I am forced to come here. But you recall that it was somehow at that summer camp that even though your willpower was not in it, you didn't have any intention to get right with God, something stirred your heart to. Yeah, you never had an intention to make friends here, but somehow it did. And you had long-lasting friendships. And people and brothers and sisters in Christ that you can have a bond now and turn to. And they are a positive and a spiritual influence in your life unlike the people in the lost world. And then you never expected the preacher when he preached that sermon. That was the sermon that made the difference, that changed your life. See, the preacher had compassion to fly over hundreds of miles, thousands of miles, to make a difference on somebody's life that may not even be your nationality, your identity, your culture, your personality. 
a totally different bird from you, so to speak. But for some weird reason, the Holy Spirit used that to minister to you. And that was people who had compassion and got you plugged in. And that's what made the difference in your life. And when we get out of summer camp, because summer camp is not the only thing that plugs you in. When we get outside of summer camp, some still have the compassion to keep following up on you. Your family had compassion to keep bringing you to a Bible-believing church. Your home pastor had compassion to preach the word of God to you. Somebody had compassion to keep you plugged in. And that's why you still retain the fire. But what happens when some do not have compassion to plug you in? Then no one's there to plug you in. And no matter how much intention or willpower you have, your battery life dies and it gets zapped and you can't help it. It's just a natural thing. It's something unconscious that you don't keep track of. And then the flesh just crawls in and then your priorities get changed again where you used to have a priority on Jesus Christ in church and serving God and anything Christian and you had a fire and a desire for the old time hymns and you were reading your Bible and it meant something to you this time and then the sermons and the Bible studies now became different to you and you are jogging down notes and writing down everything. Those things all of a sudden start to gradually without you knowing, no willpower, no intention, it just slipped in your unconscious flesh where you didn't keep track and now the notes have gotten smaller when you're writing down notes in Bible study and preaching. Now you don't write down any notes anymore. And now prayer, where you used to have a fire during prayer meeting, now it's became very dreary, bit by bit. And what you had a desire for the Bible, now you are preoccupied with your school textbooks. And they chunked up your time, so you have no time for Bible reading. You're preoccupied with your work, so you have no time for Bible reading and prayer. The devil sent trials into your life, or the Lord was testing you. And then what happened is, whether it be health problems, financial problems, family problems, now they've taken priority over Jesus Christ gradually, slowly, sneakily, without your willpower and your intention involved, but just slipped in your unconscious flesh. And then give it six months, you'd be surprised. Now it's a struggle for you to read the Bible, a struggle for you to come to church. And when you fellowship with your brothers and sisters in Christ, it's hard. It's a struggle. And that's because you didn't get plugged in. And the battery life, the spiritual life within you, that fire, has to, has to die. Inevitable. It will die, it should die, and it will die. And if you expect after this summer camp to do the same thing that you've always done and let that thing slip in your unconscious mind, then you will die, and I promise you that much. As much as I promise you that you will go to heaven, you're eternally secured, I promise you, you will backslide and mess up in your Christian walk and lose that spiritual fire and zeal, and you will repeat the same old sinful habits. You'll still have the same old depression, the same old complaints, that you were much different before you got saved. You have to die. Because you weren't plugged in. And that only happened because somebody else had the compassion for you to plug you in. And that's not real life. It won't happen every day. So what can I do? Well, Jude me mentioned something to you. You know what's very interesting? 
about getting plugged in when you look at verse 20 and 21? Did you notice everything is ing, ing, ing when you're plugged in to the Holy Spirit? You notice, but ye beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. What does that mean? All these instances of being in the Holy Ghost are a part of being in the Holy Ghost. They're not the answer. They're not the answer to be in the Holy Ghost, getting plugged in. They're all a part of this process. But there is only one phrase, only one phrase in this passage that did not have ING in it. Meaning that if you do this, then you will be building in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. Did you see that? Verse 21, keep, not keeping. Keep yourselves. That sounds like getting plugged in. Keep yourselves in the love of God. And if you keep yourself in the love of God, the author argues that you'll be building up yourselves on your most holy faith. You'll be praying in the Holy Ghost and you'll be looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Brother and sister in Christ, the basic of all basics that you and I already know, but we don't really know, and it's something that Jesus warned the church of Ephesus, which was a Bible-believing church and knew their right doctrines, is that you have left your first love. And if you had a fallen love state with Jesus Christ, I don't care how many times the battery life is going to die. Love will find a way to put life into that battery. The evidence is in that illustration itself, that example itself. If you want that battery life to keep going in your phone, you plug it in. No matter how tired you are, no matter, how de uh, no matter what interferences go along your way, if you really want that device working, you really want to, see? You really love it that much. Your heart is really into it. You're going to plug it in. Do you love Jesus Christ that much? And that's my third point, is the Savior of life. The Savior. That Hebrews 12, it was such a basic, looking unto Jesus. That way we don't be weary and faint in our minds. You have left your first love. The Savior of life is what keeps us going. A lot of people uh, here, because this is a youth camp, but then there are others who have experienced this and they'll, they'll know what I'm talking about. But uh, there's a person in my life that means so much to me next to Jesus Christ. And people understand this when they get married. And she's the one true love of my life next to Jesus Christ. It changed my life forever and made a huge difference. Changed a lot of things that I did. There were so many interferences that happened. A lot of you knew about COVID. A lot of, knew, a lot of you knew about my personal struggles, what me and her went through. And in spite of the miles apart and so many people and so many events and so many problems that interfered i did not give up on her and nothing would separate us in our marriage even during our marriage because we're very different people and very different cultural backgrounds we don't have a perfect life and we do fight, we do had stressors, and we had, we were going through COVID, so I was stabilizing both my church and my marriage life. Yeah, that was easy, wasn't it? <laughs> Couldn't God just do one and then the other next? But during that time, you know what made me not use a biblical, find a biblical reason to divorce? And I could find biblical reasons to do so? And that's a shame that Bible believers, that they would try to find grounds 
to divorce more easily than trying to reconcile. You know what kept me plugged into her? Is because, it's because I knew and I believed with all my heart and all my soul I would never get another chance with a woman like her again. And I knew and I believed throughout my previous years in life it was rare to get someone like her. And that if I lose this one, I'll lose it. So no matter how much stressful things happened, if I'm juggling my ministry with COVID and my marriage life, don't you think I have a thousand good reasons to not maintain the marriage or to keep the church going? I can pull up good excuses if you don't think so. But it was not enough to overthrow my love for her because that's how much she meant to me. Now, a lot of you young people may never have that, but some of you do. You understand what I mean. But you young people, here's your weakness, all right? Some of you don't know this. In your life, you're just going by however the world throws its uh, treasures to you or things happen in life. My question to you is, is there one thing in your life you can think of? It doesn't have to be spiritual. Do you have a hobby or a skill or some, something in life that you really love with all of your heart that nothing's going to stop you from it? You have that? If you do, I'm, you can if you start thinking. Perhaps a lot of you don't because you never thought of it that way before until you get serious in life. But I'm pretty sure you can think of something if you start thinking now. Is there something? It doesn't have to be spiritual, all right? Think of something in your life that you really love, that nothing's going to stop you from it, no matter how hard it is. Do you have a hobby or a desire or someone you love where nothing's going to stop you from getting that? That's how powerful love is. That no matter how many trials going along your way, and even there are so many younger generations who are rebelling against their families, and they could care less what their family think because of their desire and love that they're chasing after. That's how powerful love is. Love is so powerful, you could care less what happens with your life, and you're willing to sacrifice anything, and everything and throw everything and anything away just to keep that love that you want and that word of God says keep yourselves in the love of God and that's the thing that's missing in your life is you have nothing in your life that you're desperate enough to keep as something that you love and that's why you're like a robot following the matrix of the world where wherever it's manipulating you in your feelings, you're going to follow along. But if you have something that you have a goal or a love or a desire or a dream or vision, something in life that nothing's going to stop you on, then you're going to go for it. And guess what? I don't care how young you are. You are capable to do it because every young person is willing to rebel against family to do something that they want. That's how powerful love is. And that's the scary thing about love too, see, is that you can love other things besides Jesus Christ. The Bible says love not the world, meaning that you can love the world. The Bible says no man can serve two masters for he will hate the one or love the other. And that's the reason why your battery life keeps dying because something out there after summer camp attracted your attention and changed your heart. And you fell in love with that person or that thing and that drew you away from the love of Jesus Christ. But you are the person that got right with God on the altar. You're the one that was shouting a while ago, amen. 
You're the one that preached on this pulpit. You're the one that encouraged me. You're the one that prayed for me. What happened to you? You said that you changed your life for Jesus Christ. I heard you in campfire testimony, and you gave a testimony where God changed your life, where you, want, you made sacrifices to serve him. I know some of you have made sacrifices in your life to follow Jesus Christ rather than the world, but something out there made you fall in love with it rather than Jesus Christ, and that got you out of the race, didn't it? I guarantee you and I promise you, every single pastor and church people here have witnessed that where there were people who sacrificed things for the Lord, but they went back to the world because they fell in love with someone or something else out there. And I know that for my church, BBCI, that I come from because I grew up in that life. So I'm pretty sure people can really understand that here. I have a strong empathy for my Korean generations and for the Korean Americans. I know you know what I'm talking about here. And you've seen that yourself in your churches. I've seen too much of that. You know why? You're no longer going out street preaching, uh, serving God, or you don't have that fire anymore. You fell in love with something else. Something attracted your attention or someone and got you away from church and you no longer come back to church. Love is such a powerful thing that no matter how much people have compassion on you and plug you in, we can sing a thousand songs and go four hours long again. But if you get plugged in and you still have that old love toward that thing out there outside of Jesus Christ, my preaching is not reaching your heart. I can plug you in all I want and have compassion on you all I want. All of us can have compassion on you all we want. And you've seen Pastor Jeju, how he had a compassion for you, trying to know who you are, recognize your identity and your name, and he took that as very meaningful. But that means nothing to you six months later, and you will still accuse Bible believers as being that old mean preacher, that old mean church, and they don't really care about me. What happened? What, what, we, we plugged you in, man. What happened? You fell in love with something else out there besides Jesus Christ. And that's how powerful love is. Who do you love? Let's face that question now. And you answer it in your heart. Who do you love? Now, let me ask you this question. Did they die for you? Did they suffer 33 and a half years to never sin, to never do anything wrong, to go through every fleshly ailment while living perfectly? Did any of that did that for you? Not even your mommy or your daddy. Not even your pastor. Then shouldn't the person who did all that be the one you love the most? Who do you love more? That's the question you got to face. Who do you love more? It's time to face that question now because I can plug you in all I want. And brothers, you know this. I don't care if I plug you in all I want. You're going to lose it if you don't have the right love. But you also know when you have the right love, when you're not plugged in, you find a way. Get back in. And you guys know it. Who do you love? You know, I like the passage where it says, keep yourselves in the love of God. Keep yourselves in the love of God. And that's coming to my sub-point underneath the Savior of life is the search of life, search of life. Notice, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. You ever seen those who are stuck on heroin and crack? And if you never did, good, don't look at that. That's just awful. It's just horrible. 
But in California, I'm sure you've seen enough of that when you're driving on the streets. You ever seen them stopping what they're doing? They can lose homes and families and be broken, homeless, and smell dirty, and even starve. They can suffer shame for all they care if they love that drug that much. Nothing's going to stop them. You know why they keep doing that? They're keeping themselves in the love. They remembered their first feeling when they put it in their body. And it was, man, they never felt anything like that before. They thought they were the happiest individual in the world. And because of that, they want that feeling back. They want that first love back. Because they want that first love back. They don't care if they're going to be broke and homeless. And they don't care if they're, people are going to look down on them or criticize them. Or they smell. They could care less if the devil beats up and torments their life because they love sin that much. And they could care less because they love their first love. They'll never forget their first love. And it's because of that, they're searching for that again. And when they put it the second time, the third time, they don't feel it as much. But that don't stop them because they want to get back to their first love. And they'll put it in again and put it in again and put so much into them as much as they can just to get back their first love. Brother and sister in Christ, I know that in summer camp and the Holy Spirit where he worked on your heart, you remember that first love. You remember that first love when it got into you and there was a fire in you and there were tears in your eyes and you were willing to give up anything for Jesus Christ. And then when you got out into the world, that first love was fading. But if you're that desperate to get back to your first love, you could care less if the world looked down on you, criticize you, scoff you, and you could care less how much the devil would torment your life if you want your first love of Jesus Christ back. Well, it ain't the same fire that I felt at summer camp where I was shouting. It ain't the f- same feeling that I had at the altar call. It ain't the same a riveting spirit. I, I just feel dead and lifeless. Heroin addicts don't think that way. And they say they don't care. I'm trying to get back to my first love. So they'll plug it in again and plug it in again and put it into them again. And bless God, your experience with the Lord and your revival does not depend on feelings. And bless God, you shouldn't rely on feelings. If you care about your first love that much, you'll do whatever it takes to plug it in again and plug it in again and put it in you again. You'll go down on the altar even if you don't feel something. You'll shout if you don't feel something. You'll go to street preaching even if you don't feel something. You'll read that book and pray faithfully even if you don't feel like God from heaven is ministering to you. Because you want that first love back. You're searching for that. You've been desperately searching for that? No, you gave up, right? You ain't addicted enough. That first love didn't mean anything to you. You'll do anything to get it back. And bless God, like that preacher said, when your brook runs dry and God draws you to a closer relationship with Jesus Christ, somewhere along down the line, you sense being drawn closer to God more than ever before. I like uh, the verse where it says in verse 17, But beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. I like to talk about the sketches of life here. That's my next sub point, the sketches of life. As you keep serving the Lord Jesus Christ. There are some people who never lose the shout and they keep on shouting. And then other people are not as outgoing. 
They're not as outgoing. But that don't mean that they don't have a close walk with Jesus Christ. That don't mean they don't love Jesus Christ. Because everybody's different. And here's one who's trying to shout it out. And there's one who remembers. Who remembers. It's not really a feeling thing, but just remembers. From his sketch, when he sketches his life. And he looks back and he remembers... There is no greater love out there. And I tried everything out there in the world, and I remember what it was like out there. No one ever cared for me like Jesus. And I tried every other friend, but there's no other friend so kind as he. And because that remembrance turns into belief, See, from your sketch of life, when you recall those things, how the Lord ministered to you, you can trust Him with the rest and you walk by faith, not by sight. There are those who don't have their own sketch in life, but they've seen other sketches of other lives. And they've seen how God ministered to them, changed their lives, and it meant so real to them. So people who saw that, they couldn't help when they saw a martyr getting burned alive at the stake and they observed his sketch, his testimony, his walk in life, that lost individual didn't have to get burned in the stake to believe it. That person saw another person's experience of life, another person's sketch of life, and saw, you know, I think what he's got is real. And because he remembered that, he put it in his memory, turned it into belief, and he kept himself in the love of Jesus Christ. Some of you may not have that sketch where you never tried out different loves out there, the world and sin, so you can't convince yourself that Jesus is the real thing to you. The problem with younger generation Christians is that they, because they already grew up in a Bible-believing Christian home and they never tasted sin and the world out there, that's why they're more tempted to go out there. But then lost people who got saved, who tasted sin in the world, they already know what it's like out there. And they know that the love of Jesus is above any other. And that's why they commit and they stay more faithfully. Because they know what they have is real. Well, does that mean that you younger Christians or you Bible believers who never tasted sin in the world, you have to go out to taste sin in the world? No, you just have to look at other sketches in life. And you have to look at especially the sketches of life in here, in God's Word. And just believe what they tell you is the truth. If a guy who touched an electric fence said it hurts, that doesn't mean that you have to try it yourself to believe him. If you just keep in memory and believe... And that's what I did at Berkeley, see. People ask me how I survived. Because I remember and I believe from what this sketch told me. Amen. This book sketched it all out for me. Amen. And I believed it to be true. And I kept quoting the 100 promises. And I kept quoting the 100 promises of God, the 100 promises of the consequences of sin. And that kept me in his love and deterred me from sin. Because... I believed and I remembered what this sketched out for me. Amen. That's what will keep you in the love of Jesus Christ. Make you believe that his love is real more than any other thing out there. And that you don't have to try it. You know what the scary thing is in verse 23? Which we all perhaps need. And others... Save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garments spotted by the flesh. Now, a lot of us, when we read that passage, we would say it's other people because they're scared about hellfire. That they would warn other people about hellfire and pull them out of the fire. And it matches very well with verse 22. 
Some have compassion making a difference. It's like what I mentioned to you before. Other people who have compassion on you that they pull you out of the fire. Then there are others who are afraid of you going to the fire that they pull you out of the fire. But I wonder if it's possible that it's not other people who fear that pull people out of the fire, but it's themselves. I'm wondering if verse 23, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, is referring to them as themselves. Because it might be possible with that last line, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. Meaning they don't want their own garment spotted by the flesh. So that could be possible too. And if there's any validity in that, then my question to you is, do you have that fear of being separated from the power of the Spirit that you hate even the garment spotted by the flesh? See, you don't hate, you love those spots on your garment. You got to get rid of those loves. You got to hate them and find your true love again. Once you get that true love, it's going to turn to hatred against everything out there. That's keeping you away from the love of Jesus Christ. What keeps you in that love is fear. You know what really kept my marriage together? You know what really kept me faithful in my church? I was so scared. Amen. I was so scared. Once I make that wrong decision, I can't go back. My testimony is ruined permanently. I'm so scared that to get back my first love will take a lot of work and effort. I'm scared of that world and that devil bruising my life that I have to reap what I sow. It's not going to go away. I am so scared of losing my love. Me and the missus try to date as much as we can, and you know how busy I am. And you know what? When we date, it's even feeling like work sometimes. You know that? Because Yeah, okay, good. I'm not the only one. All right. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I'm, I'm surprised I'm hearing some sister saying that. If the guy said it, you're in trouble, you know? <laughs> so I'm glad I have some sisters here as witnesses, all right? <laughs> but, see, me and her would tell each other, we have to go because we know once we do it, it refreshes our love and relationship again. And we're very scared that we would be too busy to ever love each other again. And busyness is such a good excuse. But love is such a more powerful excuse. Yeah. Health is a very good excuse. But love is a much more powerful excuse. Love of my family and taking care of needs, my future with school and the workplace, is important and a very good excuse. But see, my love of Jesus Christ is a far better excuse. Driving a long ways, squeezing every dime to have gas money or to take a flight to come to an event like this or to attend a Bible-believing church every week. It's a hard thing, and if you can't do it, we understand it's a good excuse. But the love of Jesus Christ is a far more valuable excuse. And I am so scared I would lose that excuse, that good excuse. I would lose my love. Are you scared? That will quickly draw you back to the love of Jesus Christ. How many of you are scared that your love has been fading? That the one who, think about it, the one who died for you, who bled for you, who can sacrifice more than you can ever sacrifice for him, that you lose your love for a being like that. 
I'd, lo I'd sooner lose the love of my wife than the love of Jesus Christ. Oh, God. Oh, God. I'd sooner lose the love of my job, my favorite hobby, the thing that I desire, because all is flesh and dust at the end. But Jesus Christ is eternal. He is forever. And I will see him one day face to face for all eternity with the one who loved me enough to die for me. Yeah. Oh, I am so scared to lose my love for that. Oh, how many of you are so scared you run to the altar and search that love, that first love again. Every head bow and every eye shut.